Now, we come to chapter 11 here, and here is a prophecy against the rulers of Jerusalem at this time. You see, most of the people in captivity, but Jerusalem has not been destroyed. Zedekiah is still on the throne there, and they are in rebellion against not only God, but the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm reading now chapter 11, verse 1. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up, brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw. Now, there are certain ones mentioned here, and they definitely were princes of the people. Now, then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that plot mischief and give wicked counsel in this city, who say it's not near, let us build houses. This city is the cauldron, and we are the flesh. In other words, what they're saying is this. This city is our cup of tea. This is ours now. Most everybody have left, and we are going to continue on. We're going to have peace and plenty and prosperity. It's materialism of the worst sort. Now, he says, therefore, verse 4, prophesy against them, prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak thus, saith the Lord. Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. God knows even what we're thinking. He knows our thoughts are far off. They have carried on. Now, they have slain those that apparently have stood for God. Verse 6, you have multiplied your slain in the city. You filled its streets with the slain. Now, he says, verse 10, ye shall fall by the sword. I will judge you in the border of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. You see, the purpose of the judgment of God. We'll come to that again when we see the prophecy concerning what I believe is Russia in the king of the north, in the 38th and 39th of Ezekiel. Verse 11, Now this city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst of it, but I will judge you in the border of Israel. Now God says that he's going to judge them, but always there's a remnant. And will you note here, and I'll have to drop down to verse 15, I'll begin reading verse 14. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred, and all the house of Israel, holy are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord unto us is this land given in possession. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the nations... And although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. God says there'll be a remnant, and they'll seek me. And when they do, I'm going to be a little temple, a little sanctuary. They'll be able to approach me. And this was God's arrangement during the time the temple was destroyed. And Daniel fitted into this period. Now, we're great company that fitted into this period. Now, verse 17, Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people, and I'll assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Now, God would return them back to that land. Who came back? Well, those that were seeking God, it was less than 60,000. But it was the remnant that came back to that land after the 70 years. Verse 18, And they shall come there, and they shall take away all its detestable things and all its abominations from there. Now, verse 21, But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord. God says, I'm going to judge you. The judgment of God is coming. And I think today that for the ministry to ignore the fact that judgment is coming upon this earth, my friend, the greatest proof in the future there's a God. He's going to judge this earth. Verse 22, 
Then did the cherubim lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Now the glory removes from Jerusalem out to the Mount of Olives, that's east of the city. And we'll see what happens there when we get there, not next time, but in this section here. Now, verse 24, "...afterwards the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God unto Chaldea, to them of the captivity." Now he's brought back to where he began. "...so the vision that I'd seen went up from me. Then I spoke unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had shown me." Now, he comes back to call attention to the fact that the false prophets have lied to them. Jerusalem is to be destroyed. He had seen the vision. He gave them the reason for it. And that full captivity was actually near at hand. And the people are not going to listen to him, but he's going to be a sign to the nation. And he's going to act out some very strange things, by the way. But that's the way, I guess, to get attention from folk like that. Now, as we come to the twelfth chapter of Ezekiel, I hope you have your Bible, and we'll turn there. It'll make it more meaningful to you, and our notes will be of great value to you. Although in our notes we never go into a great deal of detail, that is such as we attempt to do here. Our study is not a verse-by-verse attempt to study the Bible. However, it gets down to that, and sometimes it becomes a word-by-word. Word. But all we are attempting to do is get the great message of the Word of God as we move along through it. And also, not only its interpretation, but its application today to our own hearts and lives. Now, as we come here to the twelfth chapter... We are coming to a new section, actually, and from chapters 12 through 19, here we have a section that can be labeled, Judgment is Imminent, but Not Believed by the People. Ezekiel now is going to speak to the house of Israel that is in captivity, and they are not going to believe him because he's told that here. And this section is a very interesting section. The important thing was not the reception of the Word, but the proclamation of the Word. And this man, Ezekiel, is to make sure that he's giving the Word of God. And we find here actually five times in this chapter, and probably I should point that out to you. It would help you to organize and get this chapter before you. In verse 1, he says, "...the word of the Lord also came unto me, saying..." Then in verse 8, "...and in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying..." Nice to get the word of God in the morning, by the way. Then verse 17, "...moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying..." And then verse 21, "...and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying..." And again, and finally, in verse 26, here in this chapter, again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... Now, five times in this chapter. Now, don't you get the impression that this man Ezekiel is trying to tell those people and trying to tell us today that he's giving the word of the Lord, and he's giving nothing short of that. Now, he is also told this that he's not only to give the Word of God, but he's told the ones to whom he's given it. Of course, he was warned of this before, but God keeps reminding him of it because he may get discouraged, you know. It's so easy to do that. Here's what we find in verse 2. Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see and they see not. They have ears to hear, and they hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Now, this is something that you will find 
that God said from the very beginning, you go back to, for instance, the 29th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. Probably I should drop back there. Let me just lift out a verse there. In verse 4, he says here, Yet the Lord hath not given you an heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. In other words, they had their eyes closed and their ears stopped. And you'll find that not only did Ezekiel give this and confirm this truth, but you find Isaiah did, and I'll not turn to that passage, but you'll recall in Isaiah 6, 9 and 10, Jeremiah also confirmed it, Jeremiah 5, 21. And the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember, did that. And then you will find that the book of Acts closes with that type of a statement. And that's the last time that it occurs. And again, it's a question of these people with closed eyes and ears. I'm reading now Acts 28, verse 26, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall not hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their heart, should be converted, and I should heal them. Now, anyone that says today they can't believe, it's never mental. It's always of the will of the heart. They don't want to. The man that says, I have certain mental reservations, I have certain mental hurdles I can't get over. My friend, your mind is not that big to make even one little hurdle. The problem is never in the mind. The problem is the will. There's sin in your life. You don't want to turn to God. You don't want to believe Him. Israel is just a little miniature of the world. And I think we need to look at it like that in this book here, that the condition of Israel is the condition of the world. Israel was a little microcosm of the entire world. And this spirit of unbelief is abroad today. I was talking not long ago to a man. He's a college professor, very courteous, very polite, and he wanted me to know that he appreciated. He said, I've listened to you. I appreciate your ministry and your viewpoint and all that. But he says, you know, I have certain mental reservations. Well, I had to bite my tongue to keep from telling him. To begin with, he's assuming that he is so far intellectually ahead of me that I can't see it, but that he can. And that is assuming something he doesn't have. I know this man. He and I were in college together. And when I was in college, I worked with the psychology professor, and I found out what my IQ was, and I found out what his was in the rest of the class. And I want to tell you something. His wasn't so good by the way, but he has intellectual reservations. You know what his problem is? He is today having an affair with a former student of his in the class. He doesn't know that I know it. May I say to you, she's his intellectual problem, by the way, and that is quite a problem. Now, blindness in part has happened to Israel. And that's true of the world today. That's very important to see here. And that's the reason that we wanted to emphasize that at this particular point. Now, this man, because of the attitude, he's not only going to give them a parable, he's going to enact the parable out. And this is a good one. You know, this man, Ezekiel, he's not only, in my judgment, a very brilliant man, but he had a real sense of humor. I'd love to have seen his face when he went through some of these mechanics. I think he's a ham actor if there ever was one. And I think he was greatly amused when he did this. Will you listen to him? Verse 3, Therefore thou son of man, prepare thee baggage 
for removing, and move by day in their sight, and thou shalt move from thy place to another place in their sight. It may be they will consider, though they are a rebellious house. Then shalt thou bring forth thy baggage by day in their sight as baggage for removing, and thou shalt go forth at evening in their sight as they that go forth into captivity. Dig through the wall in their sight and carry out through it. I want to tell you, this is a good one. Here's what he does. He goes into his house, and the houses then were right on the street, by the way. So he's to dig through the wall. And he's to pack his baggage as if he's going on a trip. And so he packs all of his baggage, and he digs through the wall, and he comes up out in the street. And you can imagine the effect that would have. Here comes a man through a wall and bringing his suitcase with him. And people stop. Now, digging up in the street's not new. The city here plays a game with all of us. They dig up one street, and then you say, I'm going to be smart and go down another street. So the next day, they find out where you are going, and they go and dig up that street for you. So that it's quite a puzzle. We go through a maze through Pasadena, digging up streets. So it's nothing new here. But I have a notion in that day, when this man Ezekiel comes up out there in the street with his suitcase, people are going to stop and ask a question. Where are you going? What's the big idea? Well, do you know what the message was? We find here, verse 8, "...in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, hath not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? He says, now, he says, Ezekiel, I want you to tell them what you were doing. Say thou unto them, thus saith the Lord God, this burden concerning the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel that are among them, say, I'm your son, as I have done, so shall it be done unto them. They shall move and go into captivity, and the prince that is among them, shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight, and shall go forth. They shall dig through the wall to carry out through it. He shall cover his face, and he shall see not the ground with his eyes. Now, Zedekiah was in Jerusalem on the throne, and the false prophets among the people here where Ezekiel, where they were saying, they said, now look here, Nebuchadnezzar's made two sieges of Jerusalem, and he's carried away captives. But he did not destroy the city, and he did not burn the temple, and he did not execute the king. Therefore, we're going to be going back before long. Don't worry. Now, Ezekiel says, I have news for you. What I've done is what's happening over yonder in Jerusalem. The king over there, the prince, that's Zedekiah, he thinks he's clever. He's going to slip out of the city during the siege, but he's not. And he's not going to see the ground. You know why he didn't see the ground? Go back and read the record. The history says that Nebuchadnezzar put out his eyes. This fella was deceptive. He was wicked. And actually, he had broken his treaty with Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, was more honorable than God's man on the throne over there. And that, my friend, hurts the church today, I think, as much as anything, a dishonest Christian, especially a layman that is active in the Lord's work, and then in the business world, he doesn't have too much of a reputation. Now, that was Zedekiah, and this was a hard message. This was a bitter pill for those captives to swallow when the false prophets had said, it's so wonderful outside. Now, what he's saying is this, the full captivity of the people is at hand. Therefore, he's told next here, verse 17, and again we have it, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, eat thy bread with quaking, and drink thy water with trembling, and with anxiety. Now, that's quite a stunt he's going to pull. He brings his table out in the street. 
and he sits there and he's trembling as he eats. And there are people come and says, what's the matter with you? Having a chill? Or is this something that you ate? And he said, no. <laughs> I want you to know what's happening over yonder in Jerusalem. There's famine over there. There's fear over there. God is destroying that city. That's what I want you to know. What a tremendous message. You see that this was that he's giving. Now, we have here in this next one, he says in verse 22, Son of man, what is that proverb that you have in the land of Israel saying, The days are prolonged and every vision faileth? They're saying, Why, Jeremiah was wrong and Ezekiel's wrong. And you can see we're still in the land. The thing that Ezekiel is saying, I want you to know, God says that he's been patient, but it's all up now. And the thing that's going to happen is that the captivity is coming, and God's not going to wait any longer. Verse 28, Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more. But the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord God. And my friend, you can write it down. I know it's not popular today. Everybody wants to say that it's going to be beautiful out yonder in front. The only beautiful thing out yonder in front is the fact that one of these days the Lord Jesus will take his church out of the world. And that's the only hope we have. This world's not going to get better. And we're not going to have peace. Oh, we've had intervals of it, as I gave the other day of recorded history. There have already been 5,000 wars. There was only in the entire history of the human race, there's been only two or 300 years of what could actually be called peace in the world. And man today is not building a new world as he thinks that he is. Now, this continues. When we get here to chapter 13, we find that we have a prophecy now against these false prophets, these pseudo-prophets and prophetesses. And by the way, the women now brought in, they were all getting involved in this. And women always get mixed up. Oh, I ought not to say this, but I'm going to have to say it. Women get mixed up in cults and isms. Have you ever noticed the number of cults and isms that have been founded by women are the woman plays a very prominent part in it. And I know that's not popular to say that, but we're going to have that in this chapter here. Now, again, he's still giving the word of the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 1, "...and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man..." prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, woe unto the foolish prophets. Now, what was their problem? They were prophesying out of their own hearts. And God have mercy on a man that stands in the pulpit and spends his time giving his viewpoint and not giving the Word of God, if he can't back it up with the Word of God. Now, some of us make mistakes in interpretation. You know, I think sometimes I make a mistake. I do. But let's be clear. We're trying to interpret the Word of God. And I notice when I mess it, I have plenty of folk that let me know that I'm wrong. But the important thing, friend, is to give the Word of God. These men were given what they thought. They were giving out how to make friends, influence people, and the power of positive thinking, and you can do it yourself. You should be self-reliant. You're a wonderful individual. You're not a sinner. And that was the message, you see, that was going out by the false prophets. They were attempting to say that everything is all right in Jerusalem. Now, will you notice verse 17 here? "'Likewise, thou son of man,' And notice this, set thy face against the daughters of thy people who prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them. You're to resist them. And say, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the women that sow amulets upon all their wrists. Make handkerchiefs for the head of every person of stature to hunt souls. 
And will ye hunt the souls of my people? Will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? By the way, when it says Nimrod was a great hunter of the Lord, that actually means he was a hunter of the souls of man. And that's what these cults are. They hunt out the souls of man. Now, women were involved in this. Now, actually, what was happening was the same thing that the false prophets were doing. You remember Peter says, "...there were false prophets also among the people," that is, Israel, "...even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them." And so on. Now, will you note here at this matter of these women... I'm not going to give this on radio because I'll get in trouble if I do. But I have before me here the list of a half a dozen of the cults today that were started by women. And spiritualism with its mediums and its fortune tellers and necromancers and today witches. We've got quite a few here in Southern California, but actually... I've always felt we've had them here a long time. But now they claim that they're witches. And that's what these women were doing, amulets. They give you a little something to put on your arm. That'll keep you from getting sick. That'll ensure you to have a safe trip. And then these are pillars that they put on their head. Wear something, you know, that some garment, you know. We'll give you a handkerchief, and we prayed over it, and you're just going to get well, by the way as if there's merit in that and not in the Lord. May I say to you, friends, what you see about you today is never new. It's old as the human race. And these people were engaging in it. Now, Ezekiel denounces it. Now, don't blame me for what Ezekiel did. And don't blame Ezekiel, because he says, the Lord told me to do this, and he's doing it that way. Now, in this particular section, as we've indicated before, chapter 14 here, this man, Ezekiel, has been very careful to give the word of the Lord. And the false prophets have given a background of a false hope to the people. And this man, Ezekiel, is to counteract that. Now, the Lord is just outlining here and making a case of why he judged that city as he did. And you can believe this, that the principles that are put down here are in operation today. They are not inoperative at all. God still judges nations. Now, will you notice, as we come to chapter 14 here, we see the prophecy against the idolatry of the elders and the certain destruction of Jerusalem. Now, actually, this chapter 14 is divided into two major divisions. Both of them open up with, "...the word of the Lord came unto me." You find that in verse 2, and you find it again in verse 12. Now, in this first section here, there is a call to the elders to repent. And I've noticed that Through the Bible, both Old and New Testament, repentance is God's message to his own people are those who have professed to be his people, to repent, to turn, and turn to God. And that will be the message here. Now, what has happened is these elders have come to him. Verse 1, chapter 14, "...then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me." How pious these fellows are. They came into church with a big Bible under their arm, and they pretended that they wanted to serve the Lord and wanted to listen to the prophet. Now the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, "'Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart.'" Now they were able to say, "'Oh, brother Ezekiel.'" We don't worship idols. That is, they didn't have any of them made, but they had them in their heart. You find that today, this man Samson, the failure of that man, he pretended to be God's man. And the Spirit of God came upon him at times, and that was the secret of his power. Never his hair, no strength in hair at all. And you can go ahead and get a haircut, won't affect you at all. And the very interesting thing is, the Spirit of God came upon him. Then there came a day 
he went out and he wist not. He knew not that the Spirit of God had departed from him. He kept toying and playing with sin and at the same time wanting to be God's man. How many people today in the church keep toying and playing with sin? And they think they're getting by with it. They're not getting by with it. Judgment is inevitable. They go through the form and ritual of religion, but they have that idol in their hearts, and they continue to keep up a front. Now, God says here, Son of man, these men have set their idols in their heart. They put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired at all by them? Well, Ezekiel, they're phonies. They pretend that they want to hear your message. They don't want to hear it at all. <laughs> They're going to put a knife in your back when you turn around. Verse 4, Therefore speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth a stumbling block of the iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. God says, I'll judge him. Now, this is a frightful, awful word. Our Lord used it more than anyone else. He said, ye hypocrites. Now, who's he talking to? Religious leaders. And here, Ezekiel is talking to the elders, those that are the spiritual leaders of the people. And how tragic it is. God says, I'm going to judge you. And God will judge phony religion. I believe that when a church, as well as an individual, departs from the truth, God will judge. Now, will you notice, he says, verse 6, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Now, this man lays it on the line to him. He said, now, you fellows are phonies. <laughs> You're not genuine. You've got idols in your heart, sin in your heart. And let me say this, coming back to Samson again. A great many people say, my, isn't that terrible about Samson? I'd hate to live like that man did. I wouldn't want to have that judgment come upon me. My friend, I'm afraid there are folk that sit in the pew and they would like to live in sin. <laughs> they would like to taste the fruits of sin. The very thing they condemn outwardly is the thing in their heart they would like to do. This old nature we got's bad. God says, repent. Come to him. And that's what he's saying here. He's gracious to them, you see. He's giving them an opportunity to become genuine, but they will not. Now, we come here in verse 12, and God is making something now very explicit. You see, the false prophets were still running around. God will spare Jerusalem. Why, it's his city. He loves it. He says his eye is there. And my, they could quote an abundance of Scripture. And you can quote abundance of Scripture for false doctrine today. But the interesting thing is, when you put it all together, it's not a jigsaw puzzle. You have a complete picture presented, and you can't support a great many of these theories. So here he's making it clear, Jerusalem is to be judged. Listen to him now, verse 13, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and I'll break the staff of the bread, and will send famine upon it, and I'll cut off man and beast from it. Now, God says, I intend to judge that city. That is a rebellious city that has continuously rebelled against me, and I've given them the opportunity to return, and they will not. Now, if you want to know how definite it is, listen to what he says here. And this is one of the most remarkable passages that you'll find in the Word of God. Judgment now is unavoidable. Listen to verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver only their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Now, he says if Noah was in that city, what a warning he should have been if he'd been in that city. 
Why, they wouldn't listen to Noah. They didn't listen to Noah in his day. That was the world. Now, do you think these people are listening to Noah? No. And I get rather amused today when I hear about, why isn't it thrilling that they're looking for the ark over there? And they may find it. And believe me, I think they may find it. But let me ask you a question. How many believers do you think that'll make? I don't think it'll make any. Why, even if Noah was here, who'd believe him today even? Why, they'd call him a square, an old fogey. And there's one thing about a square, he doesn't go around in circles like a lot of people today. And some of these going around in circles today think they're big wheels too. But will you notice, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, now Daniel, why Nebuchadnezzar listened to him, and what a tribute it is. Ezekiel is the prophet, down with the remnant, but up yonder in the first great world ruler's palace is Daniel. What a tribute there is. These people knew about him. They knew he was God's man up there. And Job. Now, Job was a man that went through a great deal. But if he was in that city, he wouldn't help a bit. They should deliver their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. But they wouldn't deliver the city at all. Now, God says, verse 17, I'm going to bring a sword upon that land. He's going to let Nebuchadnezzar in, you see now, and he's going to destroy it. And he says, sword, go through the land, so that I cut off man and beast from it. And again, God says, I intend to do this. Verse 20, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. Why, even now Noah couldn't save his own family in that city. They shall deliver only their own souls by their righteousness. And Daniel, you remember, saved a couple of empires. But if he was in this city, he couldn't help them out at all. And the reason God got Daniel out of Jerusalem down to that day is the reason that God's people wouldn't hear him but an old pagan king down there is going to listen to him and make him the prime minister. That's interesting. I wonder today, let me ask this question. I don't know the answer. How many churches are there where the people will listen to the Word of God? And I believe that that's one reason in this hour that God is permitting the Word of God to go by radio and he's permitted this great movement to the Word of God among these young people today, a crowd that many of us had written off. And I have read many letters to you, and may I say we have several hundred from these kids that became hippies and undoped, and they've been saved. Why? Because Daniel wouldn't have done any good in Jerusalem. But I want to tell you, he's top man yonder in Babylon. The old pagan king will listen to him. And my friend, if you folk in the churches are not going to listen to the Word of God, God's going to go out yonder today and get it to the hippies and get the Word out, and it's going today into South America. That's the reason we're so thrilled that through the Bible's being put into Spanish. And some fella said to me, some wag down in Texas said to me, says, how do you think you're going to sound down there in South America speaking in Spanish? Well, I don't know, because I won't be the one doing it, because I couldn't speak Spanish. But they are taking these messages, putting them in Spanish, and they're given down there. God's going to let people hear it today that will listen to him. And I think this is great. Oh, this is tremendous. Now, I come to the 15th chapter, and here is another remarkable chapter. Here is the parable of the vine, the vine that wouldn't bear fruit. And that is one of the figures, actually, of the nation Israel. We had that back in Isaiah. You'll remember back there in the 5th chapter, the vine back there set before us the nation Israel. He says that vine is the nation Israel. So we don't need to speculate. We know what he's talking about. But he's making a very interesting application of it here. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, this is chapter 15, verse 1, now verse 2, Son of man, 
What is the vine tree more than any tree or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken out of it to do any work? Or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel on it? Behold, it's cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it and the middle of it is burned. Is it fit for any work? Now, this is a tremendous parable. The Lord Jesus used this for believers today. And he, by the way, said Israel was no longer a vine. I am the genuine vine, he said. Now, what is the purpose of the vine? And by the way, in the 15th of John, he's not talking about salvation. What's the purpose of a vine? To do one thing, bear fruit, nothing else. He says here, you don't go to the furniture store and you say, now I want to get a Louis the 14th bedroom set. And I want it in great fine wood. And I tell you, the man to furnish the store is going to look at you in amazement and say, we don't have anything made in a grapevine. It's not good for anything like that. We don't use it for anything. Because the grapevine is just good to bear fruit. And when it won't bear fruit, what do you do with it? Well, you make a fire with it. And in the 15th of John, the Lord Jesus said, that if you won't bear fruit as a vine, that is a branch that's in him, he'll remove you from the place of fruit bearing. You don't lose your salvation. You just remove from the place of fruit bearing. And there are great many men that have been removed from the place of fruit bearing today. God sets them aside, does it in many, many ways. If you're not going to bear fruit, Christian friend, God's going to put you aside because he wants fruit. The Lord Jesus said that you might bear much fruit. Now, these people weren't bearing fruit. And God says that there's nothing left for me to do but to burn Jerusalem. And that's the reason he did it. These people are to represent God. If you have a great privilege today as a Christian, you have a great responsibility. May I say to you today, have you ever thought of that poor fellow over yonder in Africa, China, or in Russia today? He doesn't have the privilege that you have of hearing the Word of God. Well, I want to say this to you. You sure got a responsibility. There are a lot of folk down yonder in South America that haven't heard. There's been a spiritual movement down there. We get letters from even our English broadcasts down there. And people are turning to the Lord. And it's amazing to us today the people that are turning to the Lord. Why? Because I want to say this to you. He wants us to bear fruit today, and that's his message to these people. Now we come in chapter 16, to me one of the most remarkable chapters in the Bible. You have here a parable, and it's a parable of a little orphan that's been abandoned and dirty and filthy, and you just think there's no use doing anything in the world for this little orphan. And who is that little orphan? Well, let's look here. Chapter 16. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... I tell you, this man Ezekiel is not going to let you forget that he's given you the word of the Lord. You may not accept it, but he wants you to know he's given you the word of the Lord. Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Who's that little orphan? Who's that little dirty, filthy child that has been thrown out, actually? Illegitimate. (laughs) What about this little child? And who is it? It's Jerusalem. Will you notice? Verse 3, And say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity are of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother was a Hittite. Now, this does not speak of the origin of the nation Israel. He's not speaking of Abraham and Sarah. What he's speaking here is of the city of Jerusalem. Now, the city of Jerusalem was actually an Amorite city. That was the history of it. If you go back to the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis, and I think I probably should turn that for a moment. In verse 16, he says here, "...but in the fourth generation they shall come hither," again, that is, the children of Israel, For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It was an Amorite city. 
and it was also a Hittite city. And since I studied ancient history in school, they discovered that the Hittites were a great nation, and they control that land. Now, that's the background of Jerusalem. Nothing to brag about at all. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to cleanse thee. Thou wast not salted at all nor swaddled at all. Just thrown out. A little old orphan, illegitimate child, just thrown out. What happened? Listen to verse 6. And when I passed by thee, this is God speaking, and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Now, drop down to verse 8. Yea, I swore unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. I adopted you, made you my child. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with embroidered work. I shod thee with badger skin. Verse 11, I decked thee also with ornaments. God says, this is what I did to Jerusalem. The application, I think, is quite obvious. You and I have a pretty bad background. Adam and Eve became sinners. You and I were born in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. What do you got to boast about? Your ancestors came over on the Mayflower? Well, they were a bunch of sinners that had been saved by the grace of God. May I say to you, that's our origin. And we were dead in trespasses and sins. And what happened? He said, live, like he said to this city. He said to us, you must be born again. And what happened? Well, he made a covenant that if you trust Christ, he'd save you. God so loved the world. He gave his only, that whosoever would believe on him, they wouldn't perish. And so he took that little illegitimate child, dirty filthy in its own blood. And what did he do with it? He says, I wash thee with water. <laughs> the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee. He bore my guilt. No blood guilt on a child of God today. And I anointed thee with oil. And he anointed the child of God today with the oil of the Holy Spirit. And girded thee with fine linen, and we are covered with the righteousness of Christ that we can stand in the presence of God. Now, what happened to this city? Well, it became a harlot. And God have mercy today on the Christian that will sell himself to the world for a bowl of pottage. You talk about Esau selling out cheap. How many Christians? will sell out cheap to the world today. The devil can buy a lot of us, friends. He can buy us today by the, like you buy bananas, by the bunch. Oh, today, to be true to God in this hour in which we live. What a message is in this chapter. I tell you, Ezekiel is saying something, friend. Then he makes a statement, and I'm going way to the end of the chapter in verse 53. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives in the midst of them. And then verse 55, When thy sisters, Sodom and her daughters, shall return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former state, then thou and thy daughters shall return to your former state. Now, these two verses I've read are verses that several of the cults, and there are several people, have used these. And again, also chapter 37, and we're going into detail when we get there. They've used these passages of Scripture to promote the doctrine of restitutionalism. That is, that everybody ultimately is going to be saved. The interesting thing about all these cults and isms that if you take their few scriptures, and they always pull out a few verses, and that's about all they have to rest a strange and weird doctrine on, 
and unscriptural doctrine, actually, and you see what it really means. Now, actually, here, and when we get to the 37th chapter, when a nation, God says, I bring you out of your graves. Well, what's he talking about there? He is not talking about the resurrection of the wicked to eternal life at all. He's talking about, in the 37th chapter, and here even of Sodom and Gomorrah, God says, I'm going to restore the nation. That has no reference to the people who lived there years ago. That city is to be rebuilt. And if you want probably the latest on it, there is a tremendous development along the coast of the Dead Sea in that area. Now, personally, I don't see anything down there to attract anybody. But they're going there. And it's my understanding that they've been toying with the idea, especially an outstanding gambler in this country. I think he operates in Las Vegas. The building along the Dead Sea at old ancient Sodom, the largest gambling center in the world today. I do not know how far along that is or whether it'll ever come to realization. But my friend, there are a lot of folk thinking about restoring old Sodom. And these scriptures have nothing to do with the resurrection from the dead of those people and that they're going to be saved. It's that there will be a restoration. Now, when God speaks in the 37th chapter, it's a restoration of the nation, a revival of the nation Israel. And they come up out of their graves where they're scattered throughout the world. Now, actually, the Old Testament does not have the divine revelation concerning the future state that you have in the New Testament. God had no plan to bring back from the dead the saints of the Old Testament and take them out yonder to a place that he had prepared for them. Nowhere did he ever tell them that. He told them that there was to be a heaven down here on this earth. And the resurrection that Abraham looked for was that. And there is to be a restoration of the nation. You can't read New Testament development of this doctrine in at this particular point at all. Now, every one of these passages have to conform to the New Testament teaching. And the New Testament makes it very clear there's to be a twofold resurrection. The resurrection of the saved, the resurrection of the lost. And they're lost when they're raised from the dead. So you can't draw anything from these two verses here. It's merely the restoration of a nation. And unfortunately, a great many people buy that because it's unusual and they don't fit it back into the context here. Now, this chapter concludes in a most glorious way. God is going to make good his covenant with the nation Israel, and I probably should say plural, covenants. He's made several with them. And the sin of these people, their rebellion, their constant departure from him, their backsliding, will not disannul, will not abrogate, will not destroy God's covenant with them. Listen to him. Verse 60 now. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. God says, not only am I going to make the past good, I'm going to make a new one with you. Then thou shalt remember thy ways, and be ashamed when thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder, thy younger, and I will give them unto thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant. And I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame, when I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. Now, this ought to be clear today. But unfortunately, these passages in Scripture are not studied very much at all. And if they were studied, You'd see that God still has a future purpose with the nation Israel. Now, I come to the 17th chapter, and the 17th chapter is quite a remarkable one. You have here a riddle and parable of two eagles. 
and they're given to us like this. I begin reading at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. And you remember, this man, Ezekiel, he had to come at them in a strange, unusual way, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long wings, full of feathers, which had various colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of its young twigs and carried into a land of trade. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field and placed it by great waters and set it like a willow tree. Now, what's the meaning of that? Well, this great eagle is none other than Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, the present king of Babylon. And that's a figure that's used of them. Jeremiah used it in the 48th chapter, verse 40. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, he shall fly as an eagle and spread his wings over Moab. Now, he's speaking there of Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah again in the 49th chapter, verse 22, "...behold, he shall come up and fly as the eagle and spread his wings over Basra." And you will recall that Daniel, he saw the Babylonian empire rising up out of the sea, and it was in the form of a lion with eagle's wings. This is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he's coming, and he's going to crop the top of the tree. Well, who's the tree? It's the nation Israel, and specifically the royal house of David. He's going to clip it off. He's going to bring it to naught. And that's exactly what he did with Zedekiah, who actually was the uncle of Jehoiachin. And Nebuchadnezzar had put him on the throne and this man had made a covenant with the king of Babylon. And Jeremiah had encouraged him to do that. And now, who is the other eagle? Verse 7, "...there was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine did bend its roots toward him and shot forth its branches toward him, that he might water it by the furrows of its plantations." Now, this other eagle is Egypt. Egypt was still a great power, you see. But Nebuchadnezzar, you remember, he took Egypt. He destroyed the land of Egypt and made them subject to himself. And so this man, Zedekiah, he had made a covenant with the king of Babylon. He broke that covenant. He turned to Egypt. And I think it's interesting here, his branches leaned toward Egypt. And he was planted in the soil of Egypt and drew his strength from there. But there's not going to be any strength because Egypt is going down. Now, notice the message that grows out of that in verse 12. Say now to the rebellious house, know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, hath taken her king and her princes and led them with him to Babylon." and hath taken of the king's seed, and made a covenant with him, and hath taken an oath of him, he hath also taken the mighty of the land. Now what happened? Verse 15, But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt, that they might give him horses and many people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape that doth such things? Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? Now, the very interesting thing is that Nebuchadnezzar, he kept his side of the covenant. And again, I call your attention to this. God's people broke their covenant, and that pagan nation kept their side of the covenant. What a picture. We see that today. Sometimes you find some of God's people, sometimes a church, that's departed actually from the faith. They still carry Bibles, but they departed from the faith. And you can't believe them. And yet, there are certain businesses today. This is a mean world we're in. But there's still a lot of unsaved men that are men of integrity. And certainly a child of God ought to be that. And God is holding his people to it. Now, what's going to happen is this, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come, and he's going to destroy Zedekiah. 
Verse 18, let me read this. Seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, when, lo, he had given his hand, and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. God says, I intend that he'll be judged for this. And I think today that the great many Christians, I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm just saying, I sure would hate to be taken to the woodshed someday as they're going to be taken because of the lives they've lived down here. This certainly was a judgment on this. Now, notice verse 24, the last verse here. "...and all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and I have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it." And you know, sometimes God lets a godless nation harass and actually destroy a so-called people that claim to be God's people when they've departed from him. Had it ever occurred to you, I don't care where we turn today in the world, and that's been true ever since we entered World War I, and that was the great breakdown of morals in this country, and the apostasy began in earnest in this country. And my friends, we haven't had very much of peace in this world either internally or externally. There's been trouble everywhere. God says you don't get by with it. And he's talking here about a judgment. Now he's going to be very specific. As we come to chapter 18, and this is a remarkable chapter, God is going to show that he deals specifically and individually with individuals. And now we have here... In verse 1, chapter 18, "...the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying..." Now, again, this man, Ezekiel's letting you know that he's not giving his opinion. This is God's word. "...what mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are on edge?" Now, what they were doing was just simply this. They had a proverb. Jeremiah gave it to us. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. You will find that in Jeremiah thirty-one twenty-nine, And again in Lamentations 5, 7. And I think they were building it on a passage of Scripture that they had back in the Old Testament in the 20th chapter of Exodus, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and so on. The thing was that they drew a proverb, and it was incorrect. And that's the danger today of lifting out one little verse of Scripture without considering the context. And if you would consider the context of this verse that they had built this proverb on, you'd find out it's a false proverb. The fathers ate the grapes, and the children are the ones that pay the penalty. That is true to a certain extent, but wait just a minute. He will judge the individual, father or son, according to his conduct. And that is not a judgment for eternal life. He judges them in this life. He'll bless him in this life if he obeys him. Now he says... Here, and notice how God answers this in verse 3. "...as I live, saith the Lord God." That word live, or some form of it, is used 13 times in this chapter. "...as I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel." And why? Because all the souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die." Now, what is God saying here? All belong to me. If the sins of the fathers come upon the children, it's because the children follow the wickedness of the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. And that's Deuteronomy 24, 16. And so when you find the interpretation of the Ten Commandments, you find out what God meant by that. The soul that sinneth, it shall die and God will judge each individual. Now, he gives some illustrations here, verse 5. 
But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains that actually engage in idolatry, and he's walked in his statutes and kept his ordinance to deal truly, he's just, he shall surely live, saith the Lord God. Now, that's verse 9. God says here that, and then he's talking about this life, not eternal life. He'll live. It hasn't anything in the world to do with eternal life. The important thing is God will bless him in this life. And that is the blessing of the Old Testament. And then again, God comes back to this. Another if, verse 10. If he begat a son that's a robber, a shedder of blood, God won't judge the father. God will judge the son. And vice versa, verse 14. And again, you have another if. Now, lo, if he begat a son that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not likewise. And you have several instances of that. You have Olahaz was a wicked king. His son Hezekiah led in a revival. Josiah was a wonderful man, as we've seen, and he had a very wicked father. God is saying each man in this life is judged for his own sin in this life hasn't anything in the world to do with eternal life. Now, he's talking about a judgment here and now, and he wants Israel to know that he intends to judge them on that basis. And twice you have it in this chapter, verse 20, "...the soul that sinneth it shall die." And then verse 31, "...cast away from you all your transgressions by which ye've transgressed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit." For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. And that answers the new psychology, that the reason that you are the brat that you are, and the reason that you're an oddball is because your mother didn't treat you right. My friend, you stand alone. And you're a sinner because you are a sinner yourself. Don't blame anybody else. And don't let any psychologist tell you it's somebody else. You're a sinner. And I am a sinner. We stand sinners before God till we're saved. I feel that I probably ought to follow up with just a word concerning this very marvelous 18th chapter where the word live occurs 13 times and the word die occurs 14 times. So that life and death is presented here. But it's not eternal life that he's talking about, our eternal death. What he's discussing here is the way that God judges individuals in this life. And Therefore, we need to confine it, I think, this entire chapter to that type of thinking. And he gives several illustrations in here. And the important thing was that each individual stands before God separately. Though you are a lost person, God's going to judge you individually and separately. The Lord Jesus will. And if you're saved and you come before the judgment seat of Christ, see whether you receive a reward, every individual will be judged separately. There's an old bromide. It's rather crude, but it certainly expresses it. Every tub must stand on its own bottom. Well, every individual must stand before God, and you won't be able to pull that thing that you hear so much today, the psychologist, psychiatrist uses it, that the reason that this boy here is an oddball is because he had a mother that neglected him and didn't love him. And the reason that this other one over here is way out in left field, he has a terrible complex today, he's neglected, and it was because his father beat him too much. The point was, I guess the father didn't discipline him quite enough. But you can't blame your papa and your mama when you stand before God. You'll be judged and are judged today. And I think individuals are. And Ezekiel makes it very clear here that you will be judged in this life on the basis of the way that you live 
whether you're Christian or whether you're not a Christian. And back here, it had to do with the children of Israel, those that were God's people and those that were not. So that God makes it very clear here in verse 32, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord. Now, God doesn't take any delight in seeing anyone die. That is just something that is foreign to him. He didn't intend death for mankind. By man came death, not through the working of God. It was because of man's sin. And God has no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. And now we're talking about physical death. Remember, it was the Lord Jesus that even wept at the tomb of Lazarus, though he's going to bring him back from the dead, back into this life, if you please. And so we need to confine our thinking here to this life here. And it's not the basis of salvation today. Now, in chapter 19, you have two lamentations. You have in the first nine verses the lamentation over the princes of Israel. And then from verse 10 through the rest of the chapter, you have the lamentation actually over the land of Israel. And I think that land would be confined definitely to the southern kingdom. Now, will you notice here this lamentation? And I want to read the first two or three verses. Moreover, take up a lamentation for the princess of Israel, and say, What is thy mother, a lioness? She lay down among lions. She nourished her whelps among young lions, and so on. And he goes on with this lamentation. Now, there's one thing we'd like to make very clear at this particular point. This is not the lamentation of Ezekiel, as some of the commentators have attempted to say. This is the lamentation of the Lord. In fact, if you want to know specifically, the same one who later on wept over Jerusalem, that's the one that here is weeping over the princes of Judah. And this, to me, is quite wonderful. For this reason, here are a group of people in that land, and here are the princes, and who's concerned about them? Well, frankly, I have my doubts whether there were very few that were concerned about them. But God was. He was concerned about these people, people that are far removed from us today in time and in distance and in every other way. And... Who shed tears over them? God did, and very few in this world. And by the way, who is concerned about you today? Well, I'm of the opinion that there are very few. How about the people where you work? Are they really concerned about you? How about even the people in your church? Are they really concerned about you? How about your family even? A man told me some time ago, he says, I honestly wonder who really cares about me today? And he's a successful businessman. He says, everybody, including my family, they are only interested in what they can get out of me. How sad. But God's concerned about you, and he's concerned about me. That's quite comforting in this tremendous universe in which I live. I could get lost in it. I'm so small, but he's got his eye out. He has a concern for us. And what a picture this is of that. And so we have here, actually, it is the concern of God over these people. Now, the princes here are folk that I'm sure that a great many people in that day didn't want to shed any tears over. Jehoahaz and Jehoiachin. They were two kings that, in the book here, were about as sorry as they come. And yet God says he's concerned over them. God alone is. And now when he begins to talk about here the lion, that your mother was a lioness, I think that he's speaking of this lion of Judah. Judah's a lion's whelp. They were marked out like that by Jacob in his prophecy concerning his 12 sons. That's back in Genesis 49, verse 9. 
And then you will recall that in Numbers 23, 24, Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. And you find that the Lord Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5, 5. And you have that here. This is a lamentation, and it is, I think, tremendous. Not going to detail. Now you have in verse 10, the land of Judah. And I'm reading, Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood, planted by the waters. She was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters. She had strong rods for the scepters and them that bore rule. And her stature was exalted among the thick branches. She appeared in her height with the multitude of her branches. But she was plucked up in fury. She was cast down to the ground. Now, this is a lamentation over the land of Judah. These people came into that land. God blessed them. They were like a vine planted in the land. Now, he's plucked up this vine. They are carried into captivity. What a picture that you have here given to us in this chapter.